All right, let's keep going with Article 240. We're going to talk about 240.11 selective coordination. And the change here is that we added some general requirements for selective coordination. Now, I don't want to confuse the issue and say that we have a general requirement that things be selectively coordinated. That, that's not what I'm trying to say. When we have a code requirement for selective coordination, we've added some general requirements. So let's take a look at what 240.11 says. 240.11 says if the code requires a feeder's overcurrent device to be selectively coordinated with a service's overcurrent device, then that means all other feeders supplied by that service's overcurrent device must be selectively coordinated as well. Holy cow, you have to draw this out or it's not going to make sense. And in fact, hats off to the guys on the code making panel because writing that in a way that actually makes sense is not easy. When we talk about selective coordination, Selective coordination means that the fuse or circuit breaker directly upstream of a fault is the only breaker or fuse that opens. All right, so I'm not going to say that I ever did this, <laughs> but I think a lot of you uh, might already know where I'm going with this. You know, in, in a commercial building especially, it, it's not unheard of to have an incident where a 20 amp ground fault or short circuit I uh, should have tripped the 20 amp breaker and instead tripped the 400 amp main outside or the or the ground fault protection device on the 2000 amp main. That is the antithesis of selective coordination. That's the exact opposite. If that happens to you, you can guarantee you are not in a selectively coordinated system. Uh, in a selectively coordinated system, again, only the fault, only the, the circuit breaker fuse directly upstream of the fault opens during a fault. Okay, now we don't require selective coordination that often in the NEC. That might be something that we strive for in the design of a building, but it might not always be possible. If you need to use a series rated system, uh, you're not going to be able to selectively coordinate the system. The, the two are opposites of each other. So sometimes you can't selectively coordinate a system, but there are some times in the NEC where we have to. 700.32 comes to mind where you have an emergency system. Uh, we don't want to have any single ground fault take down the entire emergency system. Makes sense. You've also got a requirement in 620.62 for multiple elevators because you don't want a fault on one elevator knocking down the entire system. And you've got kind of some requirements in Article 517. If you're into hospitals, look at 517.26 because yeah, we have to comply with Article 700, but 517.26 kind of removes some of the requirements. So if you're doing hospitals, it, it's not quite as cut and dried. All right, let's look. Let's take a look at the picture here. Let's say I've got the motor down here on the left, which I know is behind the text box here, but you've got the fuse here, and we have a requirement that this selectively coordinates throughout. So if the motor has a fault, we don't, we don't want it knocking out the service disconnect, which makes sense. So I have a fault on this motor, and the only thing that opens is the fuse in this disconnect. Awesome. Now, there's also an allowance in, in 620.62 and some others that says, listen, if you have uh, two overcurrent devices in series that are the same rating and supply only one load, then they don't have to selectively coordinate. And, and an example of that would be, you've got a, a 30 amp fuse supplying a 30 amp disconnect, or I'm sorry, a 30 amp circuit breaker supplying a 30 amp fuse that's supplying the motor. Well, who cares which one's open first? Whether the fuse opens first or the circuit breaker opens first, either way, the same loads are effective, are, are affected. So you don't have to selectively coordinate through that disconnect necessarily, although you probably would because the fuse is probably going to be easier to, uh, to coordinate. So what we're saying here is this motor on the left, if it has a fault, it must not knock out the service disconnect. Makes sense. Now, what this new change is saying is, let's say the motor over here on the right has no selective coordination requirements at all. Well, if this motor had a fault and it knocked out the main, well then this system on the left is affected as well. So what the code is saying is, listen, if this circuit over here on the left has to selectively coordinate all the way back to the service disconnect, then we need to make sure 
that any other feeder device supplied by that same service disconnect does not get affected as well. So here if I just have one thousand amp breaker or fuse, whatever it might be, well then I'm going to have to selectively coordinate both of these circuits, even though technically only one is required to coordinate. If I had, let's say, a 400 amp main and a 400 amp main, well then I would not have to selectively coordinate this over here on the right because then, even if this motor knocked out the 400 amp breaker, the 400 amp breaker for the left would still be operational and this motor would still be working and we would still have coordination. So it's kind of a dicey thing. Once you require selective coordination on any given circuit, that means you might have to selectively coordinate a lot more circuits than you did under previous versions of the code. And really it makes sense when you draw it out. There's no point in selectively coordinating the left half of this building if one fault on the right half can knock out everything on the left half. So it makes sense. It's just something that maybe we didn't think about in previous versions of the code. So there you go, 240.11, selective coordination. I think this has the potential to, to kind of be a big deal if you're in the design world. All right, we'll see you on the next video.